Welcome to Tolkien About It, where we're doing a deep dive into the Lord of the Rings books from two very different perspectives. I'm Evelyn, and I've never read the books. I'm Robert, and I've read the books too many times to count. Come join us on this adventure. Hey guys, it's Editing Evelyn. Before we get into the episode, just wanted to let you know I had a couple audio issues. So if you notice that something seems to skip a couple words, I honestly don't know what happened. I think I need a new recording system. If anyone knows podcasts and is willing to give me something that I can use that's like either free or cheap, definitely appreciate it. But please enjoy the rest of the episode. I promise it's a good one. Hey, I'm Evelyn. And I'm Robert. And we're talking about it. Okay, so we're going to be covering chapter 8 in the first book, and the title of that chapter is Fog on the Barrel Downs. Now, with only that name of the chapter and what has gone on before, you made some predictions about what would happen in this chapter. Yes, I did. And what were those predictions? So, of course, I predicted they were not going to meet Aragorn. Um... <laughs> And I'm going to keep predicting that. <laughs> um, you know, eventually you'll be wrong. Eventually I will be wrong, but for now I will be right. Um, but um, I predicted, obviously, that they were going to go to the Barrow Downs. There was going to be some fog. That they might run into uh, some Barrow Monsters. Or Barrow Rites is what they're called, right? Barrow Rites. Barrow yes. Rites, yeah. Um, but I also predicted that... They would heed Tom Bombadil's advice, and they would be fine. And then I contradicted myself and said they were going to get in trouble, and they were going to have to sing Tom Bombadil's song to get out of trouble. So, no matter what, I'm going to be right. Yeah, so you're cheating, in other words. <laughs> yeah, basically. Okay. Kind of cheated for this chapter. <laughs> so, fog on the bear down. Let's go ahead and get started. Right. So one of the first things that pops out in my mind in this chapter is that Frodo hears sweet singing in his mind. And it's foretelling way, way past this. So spoilers. It's not really a spoiler because how many thousand pages of books, how many thousand pages do we still have? And I'm telling you, it's a foretelling to come. Okay. And there's been a lot of foretelling in... Such, so. <laughs> and as they leave, uh, they see Tom dancing on the doorstep. And um, what's really interesting is that the ponies are even frisky and ready to go. Okay. Yeah, they seem very well rested and more willing to go on this adventure than they did before. So it wasn't just the hobbits that got refreshed from this time at the Bombadils, but the horses as well. Right. And they take off and leave. And at one point, uh, Rose says, oh, we forgot to thank Goldberry. We need to turn around and go back. Right. They forgot to say goodbye to her. And then what happens? She's there. Ba -ba -ba -ba. She's there. And what is she doing? She's dancing on the top of the hill. Of course she is. And she beckons them to her. Um, and up to the top of the hill. Where when they get up there, she points out that you can see everything from the top of this hill because the fog has left it. Yes. You know, which way is what? Mm -hmm. And what's over there and what's over here? So... While they're up there, one of the things Mary points out is that if we stay along that line of trees, that's a road. Mm -hmm. And I, if I remember correctly, he says if I, something like, if I remember correctly. So it's like he's been in this area. Well, not to jump ahead, but he does mention in this chapter that his folk have been this way before and gone to where they're headed. Right. Yeah, but we'll get to that when he actually says it. So, but we learn that he's 
obviously come from a very adventurous family yet again. Because even if he hasn't personally gone on this adventure, he knows people who have. And then there's a few places in here I really like Token's wordplay. Mm -hmm. um, here, Goldberry tells them to continue heading north with the wind in your left eye. Mm, that's right. And so, at least in this part of the world, on this day... The wind is going to be blowing from the west. Right. And that means, so you, the wind will be in your left eye. And if you remember that, you'll be going north. No matter how twisted and turned around you might get. Mm -hmm. And we know from the previous chapter that she knows the weather intimately. She, she knows exactly what the weather is going to be doing. We can trust her on that. So they do their final goodbyes. Mm -hmm. And as they take off... It's pretty silent in the field that they're in. Uh, and then each time they climb a little mound or a little hill, the wind seems to be blowing less. Okay. And then at one point when they're on top of a hill, they look back at the distant forest, and it looks like it's smoking. They know that it's not smoking, that it's the dew evaporating off. Right. But And the fog rolling in. But Token also mentions that, it, that the sky itself... But Token also mentions that the sky itself reminds them of a blue hat. Hmm. What color is Tom Bombadil's hat? So the day is a really good day. They're able to see where they're going for the most part. They are making really good timing and they're really optimistic that they're going to be able to get through the Barrow Downs by the end of the And during this part is also when we get a really... And what's really interesting is while they're doing this walking that Tolkien plays with words again for us. Mm -hmm. And he does it in a... Very Hobbit way. Okay. He says that these hollows, these little valleys, are like shallow saucers. Hmm. Teacup. Yeah. <laughs> and occasionally he'll also call the tops of the hills rims, like a rim of a cup. Yeah. So yes, so they're they're going along and they're starting to get hungry, um, and they stop for lunch because right. of course they do. Of course they do. So when they decide to stop for lunch, they stop at this stone, mm -hmm. which seems not to be casting a shadow. Right. Um, Very ominous, in my opinion. Well, or it's just it's noon and the sun is directly high. But I I read it more ominous. Well, Token also says that they. Could be a guarding finger, and when I think of that, it's like you know when your mom puts her up or puts her finger up and goes ah ah ah, shakes her <laughs> finger. Mm. So that's kind of how Tolkien is relating. Okay, this yeah, that's true. Area to the hobbits, and during lunch they allow the ponies to stray on right. purpose. Right. So they, you know, they didn't hobble them so that they could stray and graze as they went. Mm -hmm. So, of course, they fell asleep. Right. When they wake up, the sun has moved so much that there is now this dark shadow mm -hmm. of the finger pointing eastward. Right. Uh, they find... The ponies huddled together with their heads hanging down. Mm -hmm. Like, this is not usual. I left ponies out in the field to graze. They might not wander too far, but on their own, they're not going to come together right. like that. So that's also a sign of something else. Yeah, that something's going on. They can sense. And also mentions that it feels like trap is about to close in on them. 
Yes, they're very concerned. They're very worried. And they state that the only hope they have now is for the fog to end. Right. Frodo sees a hopeful sign. Uh, he sees the gates of the Barrow Downs. Mm hmm That means they know where they're at. They think they know where they're at. Right. But quickly, hope fades as it continues to get darker and scarier. Yeah. Uh, suddenly, Frodo has no idea where Mary Pappin and Sam has gotten off to. Well, that's because that they decided that so they don't get lost, that they were going to go in a single file line and try to stay close together. And that's what's freaky. Right, because they still kind of get separated from each other. Right. Uh, at first, when Frodo calls out their name, he hears them behind him. Or maybe it's not them. Maybe it's something else calling him by name. Right, because he also hears a very distant, what sounds like a help, kind of being. Right, and then what he also finds interesting, that even though it's foggy down here on the ground, he can still see the stars. Right. And the wind sounds like a hiss mm -hmm. as it blows over the grass. Yeah. And eventually, he gets grabbed. Yep. He, and he just kind of passes out. Yeah, he's been caught by a barrel right. Right. And sometime in there, when he reawakens, um, he remembers Bilbo's words. that There's always a seed of hope. Yes. I thought it was really interesting that in that moment he was thinking about Bilbo and thinking about Gandalf and how there's always hope. And it also tells us that Frodo doesn't know this, but Bilbo and Gandalf thought of Frodo as the best hobbit in the Shire. Right. And we learned that Frodo is unlike other hobbits where he's not fat. He's not, well, big-boned. He's more skinny and active than the average hobbit. Right. And a lot of that has to do with Bilbo, I'm sure. Yeah, Bilbo, right, Bil of course. Because Bilbo continues to go on long walks and mm -hmm. so forth. Even if he doesn't adventure out of the Shire, he still right. you know, explores a little bit. And we know that Frodo did that, too. Right. With, along with him. Yeah. Yep. Uh, because, yeah, because it mentions that it was on a walk that Bilbo shared the thing about there's always a seed of hope. Right. Yeah. When he turns around and tries to figure out where he's at, Frodo sees the three other are there. Yes. Clad in white. And looking deathly pale. But um, they're laying in many riches. And all three are dressed as a king or a prince in their burial grounds. But the one unusual thing is there's a sword laying across their neck. This really stood out to me because it's very similar to English pagan burials. And the only reason I really thought about it was we just recently watched a documentary about it. And that's something that's very indicative of these burials where they are clad like their station says. They are buried with their treasures and especially they're buried with their weapon. And so having a sword across all three of them, having all these treasures buried with them, um, that really spoke to me of that of the old Anglo-Saxon pagan burials. Right which we know that Tolkien at least studied. Right. And then, then Frodo hears the poem. Mm -hmm. okay. Could it be hand and heart and bone and cold be slept? Could be hand and heart and bone and could be sleep under stone, never more to wake on stony bed, never for the sun fails and the moon is dead. 
In the black wind, the stars shall die, and still on gold, here let them lie, till the dark lord lifts his hand over dead sea and weathered land. And this poem is not much different from the other ones. It even so has the same type of cadence. Right. Yet, yet it's a little more dark. A little more. <laughs> so, than, some of the, than some of the others. And Tolkien even calls it an incantation instead right. of a song or a poem. Yes. But that makes Frodo think of... Another song. Right, that reminds Frodo of another song. And what is that song? The song from Tom Bombadil. Okay, and so you get to do it this time. Ho, Tom Bombadil, Tom Bombadillo, by water, wood, and hill, by reed and willow, by fire, sun, and moon, hearken now and hear us. Come, Tom Bombadil, for our need is near us. You say that much more Harry Pottish. Well, I mean, I am a Harry Potter nerd. Yes, you I'm are. a huge Harry Potter nerd. <laughs> anyway, so Frodo sings the song. Sings the song, and yeah. Tom Bombadil appears, but not without an answer to the song. That's true. Old Tom Bombadil is a merry fellow. Bright blue his jacket is, and his boots are yellow. Nor has ever caught him yet. For Tom, he is the master. His songs are stronger songs, and his feet are faster. Yes. And so, Tom's there. He's there Tom to, is there. He's there to help them. So he, he, he goes into the barrows with them and he sings another song and that awakens Mary, Pippin, and Sam. Right. And at some point, Frodo is so scared, he's also thinking about putting on his ring. Right. And not only just putting on his ring, Putting on his ring and leaving his friends behind. Right. He thought about it for just a moment, but then he realized, no, he can't leave them. And eventually, uh, Frodo cuts off the hand of this beasty thing. Correct. And then... The song for Tom is actually sang. That's right, yeah. We, we went ahead a little bit. We, we went a little out of order. <laughs> That's okay. We want to get to the cooler stuff first. <laughs> um, and, yes, Mary mentions about his dreadful dreams as well. Yes, once they're awoken, um... They mentioned what happened to them, but they supposed it was just a dream. Until they realized they're not wearing clothes. Right. <laughs> so, as I said, so Tom returns with the four ponies, uh, which he which he's given all very interesting names. Uh, I'll let you read the book see those names yourself. But the, uh, yes, I'm going to start with saying this. He hears Tom's answer, as we mentioned earlier. And Tom returns with their four ponies. And what's interesting here is there's a little hint that these ponies have more common sense than these hobbits. <laughs> you know, kind of thinking about horse sense. Uh, but they're covered in this treasure. And Tom takes all that treasure, puts it on top of the barrel down, and has this little poem, which is another, really, a spell. 
Right. Releasing the tie of this treasure to anyone who wants to come by and pick it up. Okay. Right. And he sadly sees a brooch and wonders about the woman who used to own it, but decided that Goldberry would make a fine owner for it now. And what color is it? It's blue. It's blue. Uh, he also finds daggers for the hobbits. Interesting for matching daggers. Yes. And Talk I love about great storytelling. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love what he says, where he says, these daggers are long enough to be swords for a hobbit size. <laughs> well, because, and that brings us back to the hobbit with Sting. Right, where Sting was technically a dagger. Dagger, but it was. But it was a sword for Bilbo. Sword for Bilbo. They are long, leaf shaped, and can be. They are long and leaf shaped, and you can tell that they're marvelously made. Yes. Uh, and the sheaths, the sheaths are made out of some strange, dark meadow. And there are fiery stones embedded in it. And it probably below. They, now, Pippin eventually asks Tom if he has been um, pursued, and Tom states that I have not been tonight. Hmm. Which makes you wonder... Okay, so it's happened before. Yeah, but how long ago before? True. Yeah, I mean, it really, yeah. Uh, and we find out that Tom does not leave his country. Yes, he he escorts the hobbits to the very edge, and they really want him to come with them because they feel safe with him, but he doesn't leave the edge of where he is master, where he lives. And um, even though they're sad about that, he gives them some final advice about where to go, that if they continue on the way they're going, they're going to hit Bree, and they're going to find the Prancing Pony, now, if I remember correctly, that that's where that's in the movie where they kind of go to this inn. Yes, this is where when Mary and Pippin sit down at the bar and they're asked if they wanted something or a pint. They go, "Y'all have pints." <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so it's it. So this is starting to get to where I'm slightly familiar with it. Um, so, yes. And then that's where we learn that Mary is familiar with Bree and the Prancing Pony. Not necessarily himself, but his folk have been there. So his family and such. And so that's kind of another thing that we continuously see is they have adventuring blood in them. Right. All, yeah, all of them have this adventuring blood in them. And they're, they're cousins. Right. Basically. So they come all... They come... Yes, of course they're going to have this adventuring blood in them because they're all cousins who are all linked to ancestors who are very adventurous. Right. Um, and then right before the chapter ends, Frodo reminds the other three not to use the last name of Baggins. Right. But to use the name Underhill. Right. Because they know that, or at least he knows that the uh, the Black Riders are looking for a Baggins. Right. And they really are ready to be around a fire, a roof over their head, and maybe some semblance of safety. Right. And that's how it basically ends, right before they enter the Prancing Pony. Right. So, any more thoughts that we might have skipped over or you're just remembering now as we're getting towards the end? Not necessarily details, but I really enjoyed this chapter where... It really shows Frodo's bravery. It really focuses on Frodo's bravery and his grit. 
where even though he is tempted to use the ring and he's tempted to run away, he won't. He will not leave his comrades. He won't leave his friends. He's able to uh, take the finger off of the monster. He's able to defend himself. And the entire group, it kind of hits them that's like, oh, especially when they get their daggers, that they're going to have to fight. Like, this isn't going to be just a travel like there's gonna be fighting going on and it really starts to dawn on them what's gonna be happening but I love this kind of early indication in I really love this early indication of Frodo's bravery and grit yeah I think so too it's they're Yeah, I think so too. It seems like in these last couple of days, the, especially with Merry and Pippin, they have matured quite a bit. Yes. Yet they are still the youngest and still mm -hmm. have that um, wanting to make a joke mm -hmm. about things that are really dark that they're trying to lighten up. Okay. All right. Well, we don't have anything else. Except predictions. So, predictions. Uh, so, the next chapter is called... So, the next chapter is The Sign of the Prancing Pony. All right. So, I'm going to make some bold predictions for this one. Mm. So, I am going to say that they finally meet up with Gandalf. At the Prancing Pony. Okay. I'm going to predict they finally meet up with Gandalf. Um, I'm going to predict that they get drunk and make mistakes. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I feel like that's something that they would do, especially like Merry and Pippin. I, and that might be coming from my, mem my vague memory of the movie, but I feel like Merry and Pippin are going to get drunk and make some mistakes. Okay. Um... And I'm going to predict that there's not necessarily going to be a bar fight, but it's going to come close. And this is purely just from my, like, my D&D minded. This purely comes from my D&D focused mind. <laughs> well, also, every movie we've ever seen, that's where the fight starts. In the bar. Right. <laughs> Especially since... I just watched Roadhouse again for the first time in a few years. Nice. So that's my predictions. All right. That sounds good. So we will have another bonus episode drop between this regular episode and the next episode, which is this chapter at the sign of the Prancing Pony. Right. What that bonus episode is yet? We don't know. So if you guys have any uh, ideas or anything, feel free to let us know at our social medias that we'll be talking about at the outro. Right. And then also, if you are looking for us on social media and you see us on Facebook or on Twitter or other places, just click the little like button. Yes. And interact with us. We want to talk with you guys. We want to know what you guys think. We want to know what we can improve on, what we need to work on. We know we say and and um a lot. And so. <laughs> and so. And like. Like what? <laughs> anyways. So, so what? So. Thank you guys so much for listening. We cannot thank you guys enough. And we will see you next time. I have been Evelyn. And I have been Robert. And we're talking about it. Thank you so much for listening. I have been Robert. And I have been Evelyn. Podcasters are Robert and Evelyn Lewis. Edited by Evelyn Lewis. Produced by Robert Lewis, Evelyn Lewis, and the Comic Canary. Music provided by Ben Sound. Link in the description. Support us on Patreon at Token About It Podcast. And a very special shout out to our very first patron, Regina. Hi! Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Tolkien About It. And Twitter at TokenPod. 
Thank you all again for listening, and we'll see you in two weeks.